Do you still buy expensive computer games? Or do you just play on the internet now, like on your smartphone or tablet, where most games are indeed pretty cheap, if not, in fact, free? Hello, and welcome to this new edition of Newton. The fact is, of course, that the low prices are putting a lot of pressure on computer game manufacturers, as well as inventors. Just recently, the famous game studio that Star Wars creator George Lucas founded had to close. The new business model is called Free to Play. And now, let's take a closer look at that, as we go to San Francisco for the Game Developers Conference. Here in San Francisco, current trends in the video game industry are discussed and analyzed. The Game Developers Conference, GDC as it's called, has been around since 1988. At that time, the industry was in turmoil. Many game developers had to look for new jobs. Game designer and industry veteran Steve Moretzky recalls. In fact, it was the demise of Infocom that triggered my going to the first GDC that I went to in 89. Uh, Infocom was shut down three days before the GDC. I hadn't been planning on going, and of course that changed my mind quickly. <laughs> I showed up at the GDC with a name badge that said, Infocom, Infocom crossed out, make me an offer. <laughs> 25 years later, the GDC is much larger and more extensive than in the early years, but the essence of the conference has not changed. In many lectures, panels, and workshops, the game makers exchange ideas about design, business, and technical aspects. Young talents use the opportunity to apply at prestigious companies. And although the GDC is accessible only to professional visitors, there is also a hall where the game companies exhibit their latest technologies and products. One of the biggest exhibition stands this year is from the Belarusian group, Wargaming. The company now has branches all over the world. Wargaming is known for its historic tank simulation game, World of Tanks. The title is free to play, but if you want, you can buy extensions and add-ons for small amounts of money from as little as one euro. We will never force the players to spend money. If you invest enough time at it, you can experience the whole game from front to back without ever paying a cent. But if you want to be different, if you want to have a more personal experience, if you want to be faster, then you can spend some money and get the corresponding features. World of Tanks is also played in Vienna, for example by Franz Hüller and Irvin Anti. Together with other players from around the world, they compete in teams against each other. You see that you stay behind the bushes. Wait, they don't know we're here yet. He can see me. He can see me. He can see me. Reloading. Wait, I'm coming. Ah, he blocked me. Very good. The means that you have at your disposal to test new tanks, new modules, new vehicles, new levels, are credits and experience points. And you get these as a reward for participating in battles and combat. The better you do, the better you do individually, the better you do as a team, the more credits and experience points you collect and the more you can invest in research and in unlocking and buying new vehicles. That's the principle. And the gold which we use in our games is real money. And with this real money, you can buy yourself time or personalize, for instance, your tank with camouflage, with stickers, with lettering. Unfortunately, there are too many very beautiful tank models that money can buy. But in that respect, I have a pain threshold. The expensive 40-euro tanks are way too exaggerated. Our colleagues from the former Soviet Union won the Great Patriotic War with tanks, 
and that's culturally embedded. This is the game that these people, these players, have been waiting for. You can't form national teams with us. For example, only German tanks in a match against only Russian tanks doesn't work. Another very successful free-to-play game is the fantasy tactics game League of Legends. With micropayments, you can buy new characters, for example. Irvin Anti also enjoys playing it. He's specialized in free-to-play games for some years now. My first free-to-play, which I played passionately and for the longest time, was Rise and Fall Online. This is a game from Korea, and I played it for six years. Here in Austria, it's very seldom that we would buy a virtual thing, even if it made us better than all the others. It's simply another mentality. I think that we Europeans play to have fun, and Asians play to be able to point out we're simply the best. Free-to-play games are an international market, even more so than computer games used to be. They are also being developed in Vienna. Sproing Interactive Media recently switched a large part of their production to free-to-play games. Since then, the staff has doubled from 40 to 80 employees. That makes it the largest computer games manufacturer in Austria. The new requirements of the market were the reason for the change, which at the same time signified a shift to an absolutely new commercial model. 10% of those players who see an advertisement for a game and visit the game's website register. Of these, 10% become active players, and of these again, 10% become paying players. But for a game publisher, it is equally important to win over the non-paying players, because an online game is only alive when a lot of people play. This means that those who don't pay create a world for those who do pay. Earning money works differently with the free-to-play games than the traditional sale of computer game licenses, where a larger amount is due only once. Clearly, a pricing plan, but is it necessarily the more honest model? The discussion about free-to-play misses a certain honesty, in my opinion. Since without psychological tricks, nobody spends money in a game. The question is simply how to implement it. In my opinion, it must be implemented so that people who play the game a lot and enjoy playing it receive an added value when they spend money. But it must also be made so that there are incentives including psychological ones, to spend money, because otherwise the game developers won't make a living and the game would cease to exist. There must be a balance in both directions. In 2011, Sproing released its first free-to-play title, Skyrama, a colorful game for web browsers where you build your own airport. Each building must be purchased with a fantasy currency, the so-called air coins that you earn while playing. If the finances are getting depleted, one can replenish them with real money. For Skyrama and the subsequent projects, manager Johanna Schober had to rebuild her team. On the one hand, on the technical side, there was quite a lot of database and network stuff that we just didn't have. And on the other hand, there was a competence which we had developed as a team. The whole design knowledge. How does one actually develop a game which never ends, which isn't designed to end, but keeps on going and evolving forever? That was a pretty big transition process in the company. And there have been some people who have left the company because they said, I don't see myself here. This is not the company I joined. But we added just under 40 people who are passionate about the subject and who are looking for just that. And that's basically where we stand. 
During the development phase, approximately 20 to 30 people are working on a free-to-play title. However, the game continues to be serviced even when it's finished. New game content must be added so that the gamer community doesn't move away to other games. If the player has the game at home, then he has already invested money. Now you have to constantly get new players so that he or she continues to pay for the service and stays in the game. That's a whole different way of communicating with the players and also leads to other requirements. These new challenges were initially also unfamiliar for Christoph Kuss. He's worked as a game designer at Sproing since 2005, and he's not previously had to deal with economic considerations in his everyday work. So in the beginning, I admit, I was very skeptical about free-to-play in particular, but also online games in general, as I come from a more traditional background, because at the time, games were more or less self-contained. Currently, Kristoff is working on a free-to-play game, Silent Hunter Online, a submarine game requiring both strategy and tactics. The game is designed in a way so that any activity in the game is free, but the game runs faster by investing small amounts of money. Personally, I would not have thought that I would ever drift off into an economic realm because that was not my core interest. That's why I went into the gaming industry. But on the other hand, it's also a business and you can't escape it, not even as a designer. Consequently, it's not a problem to move in that direction or to continue to learn. For me, there's a limit though when I would say, that's enough now. In addition to the economic way of thinking, I want to remain a designer. Sproing Interactive is currently working on two other free-to-play games. This model, and all that there is to learn about it, is currently the center of this Viennese company's attention. Nevertheless, they will not completely say goodbye to the traditional model of selling games yet. You never know how the market will develop. At the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, not everyone agrees that free-to-play is the model of the future. It's a bit like the old arcade machines from the 80s, in which one had to repeatedly insert coins. This is the precursor to a free-to-play game today, I guess, in that like, you have to pay to get good at the game, you've got to pay to, to be able to keep on progressing. Um, like, I think that in some ways, I still feel like in some ways these games are more honest because it's, it's up front, it's, it's like, no, 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 you know, you can keep on playing so long as you're, you know, so long as you're good at the game, I guess. The complete antidote to free-to-play are the so-called indie games, independently developed computer games, which are often designed by small teams or even just one person. This is where creativity and against-the-grain ideas are in the foreground. Indie game developers want little or nothing to do with free-to-play. For in-app purchases to work really well, they have to be integrated very closely into the design of the game. And I'm uh, a lot more interested in designing the gameplay than I am in designing the monetary system. I think people have a very sort of cynical view of free-to-play, that it, especially with the way that it tries to manipulate the player psychologically. Uh, you know, in order to sort of, kind of trick them into somehow deciding to pay money as opposed to the sort of upfront, uh, very open, very clear, transparent uh, deal of, hey, if you want to try to play my game, you can pay me some money in exchange for access to it or whatever. The Game Developers Conference organizes its own annual sub-conference for independent game developers. In addition, there is the Independent Games Festival, a competition in several categories. The nominated games are specially exhibited in the exhibition hall and presented by the respective developers. Most of these computer game makers are under 30, many of them students or career changers. The self-realization ideology is always in the fore at Indie Games, as the Californian game designer Jason Rohrer explains. I make my, all my own choices about what kind of game I want to make and how I make it and how I release it. Nobody can tell me one way or the other anything about it. No one can cancel my game. No one can do anything to stop me from making my game and releasing it. 
Um, so in that way, I am independent, right? I make independent choices and have full control over my work. Um, and uh, I have a direct relationship also with my audience. They you know, approach me directly on my own website to buy my game or get an account on, on, in, on my circle for Castle Doctrine. And they uh, you know, have this very direct relationship with me. There's no a business person in between us, right? The 35-year-old established designer, Jason Rohrer, is a star under the indie game developers. He deals with topics like death, interpersonal relationships, or the protection of private property in his games. I'm always trying to design a game that's very different from anything that exists. And so I have to come up with new ways of controlling the game. I have to come up with new interfaces because there's never been a game like this before. And so you sit down at this game and it works in a different way than anything you've ever played. And so it's confusing, right? You're not used to sitting down at a game that works totally differently. Um, so you have to figure out how to play and learn how to play, learn what the rules of this new world are and how this new weird object, this weird uh, technical creation functions. A recent indie game, which throws a lot of familiar computer game stuff overboard, is the puzzle game Incredipede. Developed by the Canadian Colin Northway, the game presents a strange creature to which the player must attach limbs and muscles. The design needs to be such that the figure can then overcome different obstacles. It's not too pretty, I guess. It's like, nature is, it's like a squishy, kind of discomforting thing. Like, you know, there are swamps that feel uh, uncomfortable and a lot, you know, there's still life in those swamps. There's life everywhere. A lot of life isn't um, like happy hummingbirds flying around. A lot of life is, you know, creatures in the mud just trying to get by. And, you know, a lot of life is like difficult. Colin Northway has traveled the world for over a year. He can do his job from anywhere, as long as there's a working internet connection. Traveling and collecting new experiences brings a lot of inspiration for his own creations. Visiting all these different places uh, is fantastic for your creativity. So games are such a creative medium. Uh, the initial idea has to be very creative, and then you need creative art style, and then you're always going to have design problems and art problems and programming problems that all require creative solutions. And the creative part of your brain is just built up of all the experiences you've had in your life and all the people you've met and all the things you've done. And they all bump around up there in like a boiling storm. And for, your, for you to maximize your creativity, you need to always be stuffing things up there. You need to have like new ideas and new things happening to you all the time to keep that as like active as possible. Unconventional approaches and new ideas are the essence of indie games. They're a kind of counterculture to the popular game genres and don't always need to be just fun. The graphics of the Cart Life game, for example, are monochromatic. The game portrays the lives of different characters who struggle in low-end jobs for daily survival. It's a bit like the life simulation game The Sims, just drearier and closer to the reality of life of many people. Author Richard Hoffmeyer is a career changer as a developer. That makes his access to digital games particularly interesting, says a scene connoisseur, Anna Kipnis. What we want is more perspectives in the game. Like, I think um, we want like, more life experience reflected in the game. That, that's why you're starting to see uh, really interesting games now, is that people who um, have not been in the industry for very long, or maybe like they don't have the preconceptions about games that you know some of us who have been in a, there in a long time. Uh, they don't have those preconceptions, and so they actually have completely different approaches to games, or like what is interesting about games. And I think that's that's where we should be going. Anna Kipnis works as a programmer at Double Fine, a well-known game developer from the United States. In her spare time, she organizes so-called game jams. That's where small teams get together, mostly on weekends. During this relatively short period, they try and develop some unusual games. The resulting dynamics are rare in the everyday life of game creators. At the same time, these jams offer an opportunity to inspire creative people for game development, and by doing so, enlarge the indie game community. The way that I think of indie is like kind of a new, like a, there's, there's a bit of a gaming renaissance right now happening in the industry where people are really questioning some of the assumptions that they've previously made 
um, and are trying to kind of push the limits of the medium a lot more than they had been in the past. And it's no longer about realistic simulation necessarily, though there, there will always be a place for that. But I think for indies, that's not really a great, a great um, um, what's it called? Uh, it's not really a great emphasis right now. To promote indie games outside of the fan base, the Independent Games Awards are presented every year during the Game Developers Conference. Normally, video games would not be presented so glamorously, but on that evening, they are being properly celebrated. The stars of the scene, like Minecraft creator Marcus Pearson, are taking part in the show. But the big winner at this year's Independent Games Awards was a newcomer, Cart Life creator Richard Hoffmeyer. He receives as many as three prizes, but remains self-critical nevertheless. Yeah, I don't have a very high opinion of my own game, and so that kind of complicates it. There's just so many little things that need to be improved. There's a lot of bugs still. Um, it's not really translated. Um, also, I mean, there's just little lazy things all over the place that could use some polish. And, and I, I can't see them. I try to, to like it, make myself feel better. I look at the other games and I try to find things to criticize and I just, they make me have a fuller life. You know, it's, a, it's a great time to play games. Well then, let's wait and see what the future for indie games is going to look like. And speaking of the future, we'll be attending a lot more conferences, like the largest computer games trade fair in the world in Los Angeles. But we'll see each other again soon. Goodbye.